Uh, last week, uh, I dealt with uh, this matter of uh, comforters. Uh, we see all the great tribulation. Uh, they talk about the great tribulation. So there will be a great need for great comforters, you see. Uh, because all of this becomes progressive. For example, uh, National City Bank just laid off 900 people. You go up here on uh, on West Market Street. If you come up on West Market Street, uh, you'll you'll see where. In fact, I went through it. If, if you're interested in furniture, uh, Sofa Express is closing. It's a, and you know it's a nice store. It's a nice store. Uh, USA uh, Comp USA is closing. Uh, Bombay is closing. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, National City is laying off 900 more. Yeah. And so one of the things that we've been progressively dealing with, for example, no. uh, I, I'll just review a little bit, if I can. The uh, started out with uh, fatherhood and the three phases of that. And uh, so what, the three phases of fatherhood. Then we went to, from that, we went to, actually there were three phases of the will of God. And then after, uh, after that, we went through the matter of love, the three circles of love. Where Jesus says, if, unless you love me with all your heart, you're not worthy of me. And I went through the fact that as you progress through this, this would be the third of three phases. When you think about it, in a family situation, there are those that don't love each other. So what we're talking about really doesn't apply to this group. Then there are these that love each other and love Christ. Then there are these who boot along with the fact they love God more than anything. This is a tough process to get here. So then, uh, from that, <clears throat> if we're dealing with these, for example, one of the things we're dealing with this morning is we're going to have communion. Uh, there are three stages of the matter of the heart. First stage really is God requires you have a searchable heart. So, for example, uh, when we go in there this morning, when we prayed this morning, we were talking about uh, New Year and so on. But when I go in there, I've got to take my heart before God and have him search it. Because, and find out where the, uh, these avenues are, these things that are separating me from him that nobody really can tell me about but him. And when he tells me that, then I can correct them and cleanse them and perhaps move toward this. But because there's so much of people in, in this country that simply, they don't like family members. Can, can, can you imagine how God must look at that when he looks at this and says, you must love me with all your heart. And up here we've got people who don't even like each other. They move off from under the roof in the morning. They drive around. They go home. They hate going home. They hate hearing somebody driving a drive. Can you imagine how that must be in the heart of God? And this is true for many, many believers. So when I go down here, it's unique to find out if you can see if you can find everybody in the family that loves each other. You know, or... Or it isn't divided up into some way. So when I get down here, when you think about it, Jesus said, unless you love me, in fact, it was in Matthew chapter 10. He said, unless you love me more than you love your family, your mother, your father, your sister, your wife, unless you love me more than those, you're not worthy for my kingdom. Now, that's a hard one to kind of come to grips with. Uh, so then when we moved the next stage, <clears throat> if there's got to be a great tribulation, uh, one of the things that we're, uh, God has to have great comforters. Uh, I want you to look at this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Whenever God says there's got to be something great, <clears throat> when you start with verse 4, it says he comforts us and please keep, keep in mind that when he's talking, he's referring here to tribulation. Who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may, able, may be able to comfort them which are in trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted by God. As for the suffering of Christ abound in us, so also our consolation aboundeth in Christ. 
Whether we be afflicted is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual of the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted it is for your consolation and salvation. It says, and our hope is steadfast. So when I begin to go into something like this, I have to begin to find out how, uh, how I can become a comforter. Because every way, I, I, we're going to get people that come in here. Uh, I, there are people this morning that I've got in my life, I'm praying, have terrible, heavy burdens. And it just, the one has such terrible, heavy, I, I, I really wept over this guy. I don't know if I, how many people I wept over. But I, in order to be a comforter, God says I've got to raise up a whole new group of people. And I'm going to have to train them for this. And as I train them, if we're going to have great tribulation, there's got to be people who can become great comforters. If we don't have great comforters, the church isn't really going to mount to very much because we won't know how to deal with the people uh, that are coming in, uh, to the difficulties they have. Now, when you think of that, today much hatred abounds. And the Word of God says, we're, God's grace has to abound. So when I go into this situation, I begin to go into a, this matter of what and how I can sense. I mentioned this woman at the bank who I've been up to see. I've been in great tribulation with the bank. They can't, they, they double, finally they didn't credit me with what I gave them to detect on my account. And then they credited me twice as much and then we're back starting at ground zero. But as I talked with this woman, she began to talk to me about her children and the divorce and so on. Some of you are familiar with the story. As I began to deal with it, kind of sifted away, I started transitioning the situation over to, uh, uh, if she knew anything about the Lord, I've been there before, I've had that same type of problem that you had. She said, I've been heartbroken. When I go in to see her, she brings out the three pic the ch pictures of the three children, and she doesn't have custody of them which also tells me some things. She said they were with me at Christmas, she said, but boy, she said, when they went back, she says, I've never felt so bad. I said, yeah, I know, I've been there. I know, I, I have been there. And uh, so that uh, we started to exchange things about this situation then. Then she begins to move, and we move toward, now her husband, you see. And as I talked to her about a husband, because they're divorced, I said, now, I want you to tell me the truth, way down in the inward parts. Just reach down and tell me the truth. You don't know me, so you don't have to tell me anything you think I'd like to hear. I said, do you still love him? She said, yes, yeah. I still love him. I don't know how long they've been separated. I said, do you know Christ? Oh, she, says, uh, yeah. uh, she said, yes. Then I asked, I said, does your husband know Christ? And she said, he goes to church. I said, I'm going to come back to you. I said, do you know Christ? And she said, I said, you are not giving me the answer that I really feel satisfied with. And she mentioned about going to church, so uh, there in the bank she prayed to receive Christ, and then she started crying, and she just absolutely gushed until I started to get a little, I got you know, a little uneasy. I started to get very uneasy because I thought if somebody looks at this, they're wondering what I'm doing in there, and I'm going to say my name is Bill Obendorf. Call him now. Give you nine two three five eight zero one. So, <laughs> every time I think of trouble, I think of you. <laughs> <laughs> but everywhere I look, when I was in that uh, bank yesterday, for example, I had read the headlines yesterday morning, 900 people are being laid off from National City. I just mentioned I was back over in uh, the uh, uh, Sof Sofa Express, and all the people, boy, I'll tell you, a ton of people in there are buying good deals, but people are becoming unemployed. And so when I think about this, it's God that giveth wealth, that is no sorrow with it. It's God that gives you power to get wealth, and when you don't have a job, you got to watch what God is pressing on to get your attention to why you don't. Nothing personal either, but if it applies, I'll drop it around you. No, no. <laughs> so anyway, the more that uh, I begin to deal with people, the more I should be, as a Christian, listening. Because you will not have passed somebody, and maybe as we talk about this, jar your memory. In the past week, you will not have passed people that aren't in deep trouble and have dropped you little inklings of that. Anybody have that? When I say, yeah, tell, what would you hear, Bill? Uh, this, uh, this young lady that's having marital problems that uh, 
uh, works at the hospital I was in, and uh, she knows the Lord. Her husband doesn't, and she said we're unequally yoked. And, and uh, I knew that going in. I should never have done that. And uh, this is her second marriage, his second marriage. And so the eggs have been scrambled, and now to get them unscrambled is an issue. And she doesn't know really what to do. And we didn't have much time to talk, but it's all over. That's the long and the short. You don't have to do very much. If this is, uh, this is going to happen, and the reason God leaves us here is to be a comfort, because if uh, you haven't, it says uh, in Romans 5, it deals with the fact that we gain patience through tribulation. So therefore, whatever we're going to get into, whatever we're headed for is not going to be something we'll get out in a hurry. It won't be the next cycle. It's being something we're going in collectively as a nation. Uh, are you any of you familiar with God's signature judgments? When God begins to bring judgment, he begins to bring judgments in a series of events of things that's like looking in a mirror. What you've been doing, you start to find it's being done through others, and God now begins to do the same thing with you. For example, if you read, and I made mention to this in the book of Judges, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, you read where the Israelites, when they captured this particular king, took him prisoner, what he had done, he had defeated 70 other kings. Now he was sitting under the table, with his legs under the table of the Jewish leaders. <clears throat> and what he had done to the 70 kings was, in each case he had uh, amputated their big toe and their index finger. So what did the Jews do to him? That's what they did. They amputated that finger and his big toe. Then he makes the statement and says, I can see that what's happening here is what I've done to somebody else is being done to me. So God now begins this process, and when I begin to look in the mirror, I begin to see, for example, one of the things that dollar is falling. There are three or four things that God right now is warning us about money. Uh, and Dan, you could probably expound on this better, better than me. Uh, but a, a, as we look at these things, uh, at the, as they start to tighten up, for example, we find one of the things that Christian Missionary Alliance under a great strain today because of the falling dollar. You see, falling dollar means that they're going berserk in the mission field because now our money can't buy over there. Second thing is the euro is increasing in value. They're now finding and calling our, our currency into question, you see. Uh, not only do you get a, a credit crunch, for example, on subprime lending, which two things happen and what they do with subprime lending. When they have their mortgages default, keep in th mind the other things people can't pay. Now on the radio, you've probably heard them like I've heard them, but all kinds of people saying, call us and we'll handle your debt. Anybody hear those ads? When the bank doesn't get paid the mortgage, now the second thing happens, the mortgages who can't pay, can't pay the credit cards. Now, when the credit cards can't be paid and the mortgages can't be paid, what happens to the bank? You see, then there's a credit crunch because now people can't borrow money. Then our dollar begins to drop internationally and all of a sudden we've got the word, what Jesus used, we've got the word perplexity. There comes a time when people sit around the table and they've exercised, everybody looks for options. And they say, you know what? There are no options. The cupboard's bare. Now when you get the rank and file who, ble who are told this, nobody likes to hear it. Well, I look at it too, the undermining thing of all this is sin and it's greed. Greed. Um, which is sin, and again, you can see how God's dealing with that. And uh, you know, I think you mentioned the banks and that too. And I think about you know laws about uh, usury, we're charging exorbitant interest rates. And you mentioned credit cards, and it's like that, that, that it used to be when eighteen percent was pretty extravagant. Well, that's nothing nowadays. They're pushing thirty. It's like this is yeah. ridiculous, and put people in bondage if they get, get, get these things. So people are in bondage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you see this. God says, how do you get people out of bondage? Well, what happens is there's a separation of, of the heart. You see, there are three elements that God deals with every heart. In order for him to get comforters out of this, 
God has to begin a separation problem process in the heart. Anybody that's preoccupied with the things that have strings attached to it won't be used because they get preoccupied with the strings that are attached to them. Therefore, any time that I have a double-minded heart and I go this direction, I begin to sense that there's a tremendous loss here and we have a lot of church people whose hearts are not right and so God says the first thing that you have to look at is I'm searching for somebody, if you go over to uh, 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 16. I'm already there. Don't have to look at it, I'm already there. I'm... It says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect. Toward him. So the very first thing that a person needs when I go out here this morning and go into this communion service, in 139th Psalm it says, search me, I have got to have a heart that's searchable. If I don't have a heart that's searchable, because my own heart's deceptive, and when I begin to look at it, sin today is not simple. It's complex. Somebody says, well, how is sin complex? I'll go back to the credit thing. How many of you have received, how many of you would say you've received 25 credit cards in the last year? Received offers? Applications. Yeah. Well, the first week, did you say? Applications. Applications. Oh, yeah. yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. They come one right after the other. Now what do we got? We got all kinds of people who are in bondage to that. Now I've got a, it's a complex situation. There are all kinds of things that I can get into that look simple today, but are not simple. Second is, they're subtle. I hear all these things that are advertised, and you know, on any uh, prescription that you're given, there's always side effects. When I read the side effects, I think I'd rather die from a problem. <laughs> Exactly. Tells me I could have gout, no, bad heart, prostate problems, hoof and mouth disease, festered hairs, and growing toe. I can get all of those, but it's subtle. So if I listen to the next thing is sin today is complex. So when I talk to people, if I think I'm in pretty good shape. I take my heart out here this morning, and the first thing I do is I put it for God, and I do exactly what he tells me to do in Psalm 139, because the only way that he's going to hear me is if, first of all, he and I can do business on these subjects. And so I take my heart before him, and I say, now, you've got to search it, because I'm not smart enough to know how this looks before you. I've got to do that. Otherwise, I'll kid myself. I'll kid myself. Now, a perfect heart has got to know its condition before God. Everybody looks pretty good when they come in in the morning. You look pretty good this morning, Jeff. She, she looks better, but okay. that's a normal life. That goes with that And so if I, if, I don't, if I don't grasp what this is for out here this morning, I've just gone through a routine. This is another part of our Sunday worship service, and I'll go through this, and it really won't have much bearing to me. But because that my own heart is so complex and devious, God will, I never will forget. Somebody was talking like I'm talking this morning, and uh, he said, uh, before we go any further, he said, I want you to ask God to search your heart. So I'm sitting, uh, I was sitting up in the balcony. I thought, I just gave it sure. I said, oh, yeah, okay, Lord. Search my, boom. Something jumped out of my heart, hit me right in the chin. I couldn't believe it because I know it was from God because I wasn't thinking about it. Boom, it hit me. Whew. I want to tell you that I, I wasn't sitting in that seat casual anymore. I was sitting up straight and I'm paying very severe attention to what's being said because what that guy just said, I just did. God just brought something up. And now I'm, I want you to know I'm really focused on it. <laughs> 
I'm really focused on, you know why? Because it had gone back out of my memory system. It wasn't on my page anymore. It wasn't there anymore. God says, that's all right, it's on my page. Boom. It blew me away. Last Sunday, there was an older man here. Oh, I say that. He's probably younger than me, so I won't. Uh, years ago, he came to our church and we were at the other location. And uh, he was divorced. He brought another woman with him on this particular morning. So, uh, a long time ago. So, uh, he had been coming to church and uh, I was talking with him and I said, you know, I said, I really believe when you get into the Word, you're, you're looking in the wrong direction. I said, uh, you better be extremely careful of your progress. I quoted some scriptures about what it says about his involvement because he has a, he has a living mate. Last Sunday morning, he came up to me and he said, you know what you talked to me about back at the other church? I, I said, well, help me. He said, that went in. I never forgot it. And he said, I handled that. And he said, from that time on, I've been saying the same thing that you told me that morning to other people. Because when God strikes a heart, it's the only time I can hear. And unless I can hear, I won't have any convictions about my past whatsoever. And it doesn't. And the reason you have to have God search your heart, the only reason for that is the things that you'll forget that God hasn't forgotten. If you're saved and they go back a long time, it doesn't put you under the indictment of sin. It puts you in the indictment of cleansing because this process that I'm going through finally will be the ultimate hope that I can cling to if my heart has responded this way that will get me into eternity, oriented the way I should be oriented. So he says, you've got to come up with this perfect heart. Now, in the Beatitudes, there are three Beatitudes that he specifically mentions the results of you being and me being either family members or citizens. For example, with all the uncleanness that we have today, he says, blessed are the poor in, uh, blessed are the pure in heart. It's only one he mentions the heart. It says, they shall see God. So when I go to the, the keeper of the values in a country and somebody begins to mention abstinence and everybody wants to go to war about that word, I can't help but conclude that the people in that country are becoming filthy. I see this poor beguiled Britney Spears, now her sister's pregnant. I understand that they were at uh, the Crystal Cathedral and she went down to the altar with her mother. Ooh. What I see is a girl whose last estate is worse than her first estate. Now God has given her a platform, but now you know what's happening? She's becoming a disgrace. Why? Because of this. You see, you call, I'm saying that when we become this way and we start to be advocates for condoms and Viagra and all that other filth, God says, I'm in the process of bringing judgment in a hundred different ways and unless you see what I'm trying to tell you, you're going to think your problem's economic. The problem's not economic, stupid. The problem is spiritual. So he said, if you're going to see God, you've got to have a pure heart. And so, we'll back, go over to Isaiah 29, verse 15. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be what children is? of God. Isaiah 29, we'll go to verse 15. It says, Blessed are the poor in part of spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. That addresses family members. 
intimacy. Isaiah 29, 15. What are those who seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord and their works are in the dark? I listened to the those who are running for president. <clears throat> Anybody have any opinions on those running for president? <laughs> Nobody has. <clears throat> when I see a man who's my age with a wife thirty years younger than him, that does something to me. Because when we begin to look at what it says. How can I give the country to a nation of a, of a nation of this many people to somebody that hasn't been even faithful to his wife? Which one is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Current or present? No, which, which, which guy are you talking about? Oh, several of them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you'd be more likely to be able to pick one out that is in this situation than one that you would pick out that is. There are very few of these men who are involved in the first marriages, you see. That's all right. Mr. Giuliani, for example, is either in his third or fourth and was unfaithful to his wife while he was still married to her and became public knowledge. Then he does a despicable thing by bringing shame on her and disgracing her by giving all his attention to the elder woman. He doesn't have any clue to how he stands before God. But, for example, I want to go back to the signature judgments. When a person does something like that, from that time on, they can't think right. Now, that being the case, do I want him for president? I'm not saying whether he's a Democrat or Republican. You, I, give you, I can give you a few other illustrations of you. But when I start going down through men, you know what they are? They are going to stand before God who permits them to... Keep in mind that if you go to the book of Dan uh, Daniel chapter 4, it says he permits the basest of men to rule over you. So when the nation becomes base, you get a base leader, you see. In other words, you're getting what you deserve. Then when the calamities come, you know what he gets? He gets counsel from the ungodly. He doesn't know the difference. Mm -hmm. you see. I, th I think of McCain, for example. I, there's a tremendous amount of respect for him. Look at him. His wife is 30 years, 40 years older, younger than he is. Where are we coming from? You see, if I can't be faithful to my, to my wife, then I question how you can lead a nation. If you've been breaking fundamentally what this says, then it tells me a, a way I should live. And if I'm not living that way, how can we trust anybody who simply hasn't exhibited that they can be faithful? Now, I don't know all the details. And I, I, I'm not, but these men, some of these men I've gone to prayer for. You go to Fred Thompson. His wife is 30 or 40 years younger than he is. Well, all of a sudden I'm saying, what does a man have to say? Why did he end up in that condition? If he's a leader, why didn't he just stay as he was? Those are questions I can bring to the table, you see. But when I, when I get into this, I'm saying God now is going to give us choices. Now, when I went back to the fact that sin is for subtle, it's very, very subtle. It's very complex. As I sit out here and watch people, I'd want to tell you, I was in business for 45 years, and I can tell you the number of businesses, uh, small businesses in this town that went down the tube when people became successful, and then when they got money, went out and do, started doing other things. You know what happened to their business? Straight downhill. See? Why? Because God says he sees in secret and what you're doing in, in secret. If you think you're hiding it, he's going to show it publicly. How can that come forth? After all of this tragedy that these people have gone through, then it steps forward of what they've been doing. We see the financial results of it, you see. We've seen all kinds of this stuff take place. God says, I'm keeping track of everything that goes on in secret, and if you're not faithful, what do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to give you somebody just like you. Now what do we do? We look in the mirror. Why? Because we can't tell the difference. You see, if you can't tell the difference, then I go back out here and I say, you search me and try me because you know why, Lord? My kids have got to live under this stuff. And my grandkids, I got a great grandchild coming. 
So if I have a vote that God is offering me, I better know something about what the person is, not what he says, you see. All these become choices that are out there. Are we at, am I advocate for a political party? No, because I go on the other side, I can get the same thing, you see. I have to admit, it appears Democrats are not as quite as much uh, viable as uh, the other side. But God says, if you're only going to listen to what the person says, you don't have the picture of who this man would be who becomes your leader. And you know what? One after another, nations fall in this trap. And then who falls in the trap? I fall in the trap. I want to tell you, if somebody can get up and say they think they can fix this economy, i got a question with that. Only God can do that. Secondly, one of the things when you lose your discernment because this business gets so subtle, we get wrapped up in the way a person looks. I don't know anything about, well, I do know some things, but we have one person who has a Muslim name. See, now, what is our orientation not to judge that man on the basis of his name, but to take him before God and say, God, how does this man look? Now, the interesting thing about it is, as I move into complexities, I now see something somewhat unique. Perhaps I see a moral person, married to his, first, for, to his original wife, children, family man. I start seeing some things that look now in complexity. Why? Because he's not, he, he's an entirely different cut. And he's got a lot of grace and he's got a lot of charm and I'm starting to get attracted to that. You know what? Oratory is what put another great, well, a despicable leader. He was a master orator. It was Hitler. He was a master orator. He can make the crowd spellbound. And what happens? Listen to what happened in Germany. They brought in higher criticism on the Bible, essentially through the Lutheran faith. As they started, the highest criticism was, it doesn't really mean what it says. Now, as an educated scholar, I'll interpret it for you because you then will be able to grasp what it says. God raised up Dietrich Barnhofer. You know who Dietrich Barnhofer is? A great German theologian who was hung by the Germans 10 days before they were liberated. Why? Because he stood up against them and he said, this man is a liar. This, he was one of the few, one of the few that didn't get swept up in the master race. You see, he was one of the few, they, they took away his credentials because when he spoke, he spoke the truth. The people were so mesmerized by what they were hearing from this eloquence. You see, they became blinded as a nation. So what do I have to do? I have to keep my heart before God because if I don't, these things can sink me, you see. So I need a searchable heart. Next. I need a trusting heart. We go to any church in America this morning and say, how many of the congregation trust Jesus? How many hands do you think would go up? Then what happens? Financial difficulties. One of the first national uh, situations that people become faced with, first of all, Hitler brought in great prosperity. He brought in a great septic moral system. For example, uh, that was all a situation that was somewhat under the different form of the threat that we have today, but if you didn't follow the party line, what do you think happened? Not too many choices. God will bring in something that causes me to have a trusting heart. Because always God has to bring these things to pass because I can't do it. So he says, do I have a trusting heart? Well, do you? Do you have a trusting heart? <clears throat> a trusting heart is not resignation. That just simply says, this is the way it is. Nothing can be done about it. So we fall into that trap. <clears throat> a 
when I am trusting, I get a narrow view of circumstance. When I get a narrow view of circumstances, I have the ability to hone in and begin to recognize when I'm getting an answer. And I'm getting, because in any type of situation I get, in, God always gives me an exit strategy. I'm involved with a guy now that I, I'm trusting that God's going to do what he says because I see no way out for this guy. And I have to keep my heart before God because if I listen with him, I can go right down with him. When I listen to him and the perplexities, it's, it, uh, there is no way to discuss how this thing can be handled so the way can get out, guy can get out of the problem. God has to get this guy out of the problem. And I've spent enough time going through all this kind of stuff to know that. But I, the other night, I, got, I did something that kind of got checked on. I'm working with him on plan A. He doesn't know it. But I'm, I've considered plan B. Little test. You better go back to plan A. Stay with me on plan A. When I get that kind of a word at plan B, and I hear about going back to plan A, here's what I say. What if? You see? Then here it comes, double-mindedness. The minute I start to get double-minded, I begin to sink because I start to think, what, the worst. Normally, that's why plan B doesn't work. Plan B doesn't work because if I'm inclined, as I, I, I look at this, for example, if the guy, if he didn't have bad luck, you wouldn't have any. On top of everything else, his, mother, his wife's sister dies in Pennsylvania. Two weeks ago, she was so bad, he had to go to Pennsylvania. So I say, do you have the money to go to Pennsylvania? He said, no. So I meet with him and provide for that. But she doesn't die. I got to watch how I think. <laughs> Please don't laugh because you know what I mean. This weekend, she passed away. Friday I talked to him, I said, do you have money to go to Pennsylvania? He said, no. So we meet again, you see. I'm thinking, uh, this, this is, uh, you think you got problems. Yeah. This guy's got so many problems. He's got so much in housing inventory. And the interest he's paying would sink a ship. And he is, something that offers a test of my what. Now, I've led this guy to Christ, and he does come here. He hasn't been here in a few Sundays. But I have to stay in there because, as he looks at me, at this stage of his development, I've got to hold his arms up. And mine are awful tired, you see. And I can feel it. I can feel it. I can feel it. When the phone, is it him? You know, I, what next do I associate with him? God says, I have you in this man's life. Why? To see if you trust me. Frankly, if I didn't have him in my life, I wouldn't have any, any serious problems. But this guy's got me in a serious problem, big problem, personally, as well as just being involved with him spiritually. God says, you've got to trust me. Toughest thing in the world to mean it. Boy, is it easy to say it. And I, I, I'll bet you in the last month, you, 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 you've certainly implied that you're trusting God up until you're alone and quiet and everything is drowned out. And then what comes back? The what ifs. Go ahead, Dad. Sure, I need son. you. Well, we, just, we just had prayer Thursday. Do you trust me? Are That's gonna, right. Are you going to do that? Be, no, so. the, the, it won't take any time to get a test. Now, when I, when I run into a guy like that, I always tell him why I'm giving him money. I, see, I always tell him, when I'm giving you this, don't look at me and thank me. I'm giving you God's money because he's giving it to me. If you're lying to me, it's up to God. Don't worry about paying me back. Secondly, the other side of the coin is, if I'm giving you God's money 
and God is in this, our meeting, I've got another question I want to ask you. Do you know Christ? Normally when God brings somebody like that into my life, they have two needs. How do I fill the gas tank? And how do I work in their heart? See? Because I'll ask them candidly, do you know Christ? Because you're getting this not on my good graces. See? I grab my wallet like everybody else. But, here's what it says. He that would ask of thee, turn not away. Well, I did ask him, and he said he did know the Lord. And, uh, Good. One thing I noticed about it, too, because I guess I had shared, uh, Jameson was with me a while last year, and somebody, we were at rallies getting something to eat, and he was looking for uh, something to eat. So we got him something to eat, and then he was like, right away, that's what he asked for, that's what I provided, and he wants something else now, and ungrateful. So... With this person, he said, I knew the Lord. Because the other guy said, I'm a Christian too. This man said, I know Christ. And his attitude then was a gratitude. Uh, you made me feel good. Mm -hmm. That's a great end of the story. And I check people too. Uh, I never will forget. I, I may have mentioned the Indians came in my office. He came in there. The guy says, I don't know. I just felt I should stop here. He says, I got my family in the car. And he says, I, we're out of gas. So I said, okay, we'll go down. We got him some gas. I led him to Christ after he came back in my office. Then afterward, he said, will you come out and talk to my whole family about that? Went out and the whole family, you see. Now, the interesting thing is, why is a Christian running to the point that he doesn't get, have enough gas to go from point A to point B? You see. God doesn't make anybody... No child of his is going to be a beggar, but the guy that uh, God is dealing with, for example, who came to you as a Christian, who God was just dealing with, right? Mm -hmm. you were, we were just discussing some. Right away, there comes a test. You recognize it. You become a blessing to that guy, right? Right. right. Yeah. Instantaneously, because you responded, you became a comforter in what? His tribulation. Mm -hmm. This type of thing is going to be all over. Somebody says, where am I finding somebody in really great tribulation? That guy may have been standing beside the road. His car's out of gas. He's standing there praying. Lord, I'm out of gas. Don't have any money. Good grief. Is there somebody out here that you can tap on the shoulder and tell him to stop? Hi, Dan. Up pulls Dan. Go ahead. Well, the follow-up to that is, is in how it reflected on us because Kelly's uncle had died, and there's a small inheritance involved. So some additional monies coming. We know that they're coming, but guess what? Right after I did that, I think your mom stopped by, like was it that day or the next day, Sunday. that day, with a check. See. So. <laughs> a anyway, when I begin to see how God involves Himself in this, go to Psalm 24, please. Normally, when I have something up before God and the test gets bigger, how does the test get bigger? The test will always get bigger on my trust when the problem gets worse. If the Lord is giving me some really serious tests now where he's saying, now look, I want you to understand something at the rate the, from the get-go. You're in a situation now, there is no other answer. That's when, I want to read this. Our, starting with verse 4, Our fathers, fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. They were not confused. Where are you, where are you at again? I'm at uh, 22. Did no, I say 22? You said 24. Oh, you weren't listening. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's what we want to listen. So we'll four and five. Thank you. Our, <laughs> verse four. Our fathers trusted thee. They trusted thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted thee were not confounded. When I get to the point that I'm looking at the problem at a different level, the problem now can be so, com so severe that there is absolutely no way out of the problem. What happens is I start to get exhausted because I keep trying to punch holes here and a hole there. No, I'm not getting anywhere. That's where I have to back off and stop looking because there isn't any way out. Ultimately, not to be confused as I run from point to point to point, not to be confused is the fact that God is saying the best thing for you now is the toughest thing for an American to come to grips with. Your trust is to stand still. Somebody says, you don't understand, I've been waiting for this. God says, 
and working through the will of God. God doesn't answer prayer in my answers. He answers in my delays. Anything that is really to stretch me in any waiting game involves a big stretch. He says, I want to stretch you because your thinking is going to go until it becomes passive. You're going to work out in your mind all of the difficulties that will result in that activity happening. Well, you know, I'll go bankrupt. Uh, I won't have an income. We will play within our minds all of the consequences that are going to fall out from this thing that has got my attention and I have to trust God for. It will, do, and I'll go around and around in the circle, not being able to get out of the loop because I can't get the answer. Therefore, he says, just stay right there. The toughest thing for anybody in our country is to wait a few minutes, or a few hours, a few days, a few weeks, a few years. Why? The more I wrestle with this thing, the more confused I get. Because the more confused I get as I go around the track, I always end up where I started from. There's just no answer to it. That's right. Therefore, he said, a trusting heart will not be confused. It will not be double-minded, you see. The minute and the thing that I told you about started to go to plan B, God says you're getting off the track. It's just as bad as you're seeing it. I, I, and frankly, I got a lot of money involved in this. And I, I'm praying that this guy doesn't come and ask for any more. <laughs> got the picture, don't you? So, but God says, you've got to realize whose money you're dealing with, you see. We don't deal with God's money. We deal with our money. God says, I have to trust, teach you so much for you to learn that it's not your money. Because when you die, maybe you can take it with you. Billy? Got a question then for you. I'm sorry, sir? Got a question then for you. Please. Uh, at what point do you, do you come to the conclusion that uh, enough is enough because you're not making this person stronger, you're making them weaker, you're becoming an enabler. No. God knows the other heart. I can tell you about the man I'm dealing with. We have reached a point of, of the limits on this, but I'm going to go back and tell you something I'm absolutely convinced about in my own heart, and that conviction comes from God. Even though this man hasn't been able to perform, my heart is convinced he has always told me the truth. I know that. Even though this thing has, has taken a stretch now where he can't perform what he told me, I know that there are circumstances, and I know how the devil, because I believe this guy, I see the innocence in the guy I'm dealing with. Behind him is the one who wants to destroy him. The one who's wanting to destroy him, he didn't emerge into this. He's been led in this by an enemy in such a situation that's pressing on him from several avenues that his decision to do what he said he would do for me, he's become victimized by others who have let him down, who have, in my essence, have deceived him. As I prayed over this, for example, the bank was going to give him a draw, didn't give him a draw. Banks give your, your draws. I said, why didn't they give you that? Because I, I'm with you. If this guy has deceived me, I'm, I'm hung. Mm -hmm. I have a clear spirit in that. But let me respond this way. I cannot raise that question about this man in this situation. I guess the thing that I'm saying is, if I, could, if I raise that question in my heart, I would find that God is orienting me not to trust or support that thing anymore. Why? Because if, if he has a need, and God knows his need, and he brings him to me, and I read what it says, I'll give you an illustration. I had this guy call me about a place, he, he was homeless, didn't have any money, his van was out of gas. Is this a I said, guy? I'm sorry, man? Is this a different guy? No, yeah, this is a different guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> and he called me and asked for his place to stay. But it was late at night, and I said, I'll, I'll get into this in the morning. So I called the Haven Arrest, and I said, because I know the places are all full. I called Haven Arrest, I said, Mr. Walker, will you take this guy? He says, sure. Call him and tell him to call such and such. Now, here's what happened when I called him back. I called him back and said, I have a place for you at the Haven Arrest. 
Now listen to his response. Did I tell you this before? He said to me, they, the last time I was there, they didn't treat me well. <laughs> you know what? This guy, as far as his need in my life, he's dead. God just says, check him off. He, I'm still working with him. He's going to have to sleep with that frigid van for a few more <laughs> nights and have his stomach empty. You know why? There was no gratitude there in that man. I see this man it, with his heart torn out, this other man, this heart. I sense his heart. God has given me this guy's heart. I know that. I couldn't hurt this man. You know what? If it's a wash, I don't care one inch. Why? Because God put him in my heart to give him the money. He belongs to and it's your money, you deal with him. You follow? I'm free of this in this man. Now if I heard him tell me something, because I'll tell you the other side of the coin, be sure your sin will show, find you out. If I'm doing something for him spiritually and meeting his need and his heart is truthful, he can, his need can be met. However, if this man's heart is not truthful, you see, I'm going to find out another way that this, he's deceiving me. I had this just happen. Another, somebody came to me recently and told me something. I didn't know that this was in a game plan. God will ensure the fact that you are going to get information that your decision on what you concluded was absolutely on target. Forget about it. Go to bed. You don't owe anything. Therefore, it would be very difficult until I can see this pattern of how God is working with hearts that I'm going to be protected if my heart is right toward God about what you're doing. You will not deceive me. Why? I have done what he said. If I'm trusting him, he says, I'm not going to be confused about my relationship with him. If I'm confused about this relationship with him, there's another thing in the mix. Did I answer it? I think there's, I think there's uh, uh, another part to it, too. Please. It's God's money. If, if, you're, if you're using God's money to, to help somebody... And you're doing it in the name of the Lord. You're doing it for His honor and His glory. You're free. Yeah. Even you if know? you're being cheated. Pardon me? Even if you're being cheated, you're doing it with the right Absolutely, hand. because you, I think there comes a time when you have to leave all that with the Lord. Right. Period. And stop thinking about, well, I've given a thousand, I've given five thousand, I've given ten thousand, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Because because it's a test from the Lord. That's right. But God will not let you be oriented with confounding you with foolishness. If this, God will bring it to a conclusion. Uh, the other day I was at um, getting pizza and a woman came in and said, I have a car full of my kids, we ran out of gas, the whole story. And I said, fine, I'll fo follow me down to the gas station and I'll fill your tank up. I didn't know if she was telling me the truth or not, but mm -hmm. I was trusting. So yeah. I went to the gas station and she never came. She wanted cash, oh, no. yeah. and um, when I went to the gas station, I waited 10, 15 minutes, she never showed up, so I knew she was trying to bluff me. God is going to protect you if you're doing what he... Yeah. Let me say this, any time that you become... Yesterday when I went to the bank, they had credited me for the amount that they messed up on in my account to begin with, but they gave me an additional credit for another $16,000. That's not my money. I said, you guys got this all wrong. So we went back through. But you see, right away, the, what do you, how do you think the enemy is? What difference does it make? Who's going, who's going to know? That's a windfall. So, yeah. you, you stole my line. It's a bank's fault. Look at all they've been putting you through. And, uh, bro, see, it doesn't take anything for the subtility of that to work in me to justify while I do it. The, the, the biggest problem a believer has one of the problems we're so financially tight is that believers have squandered God's money. Somebody says, I I'm tied to the wall. Why are you tied to the wall? How did you handle God's money? God says, you didn't handle my money, you handle your money. See, he's always working for money. It's one of his big tests, but he has to shake me up from it. I don't know how much time we have, but the third arena I've got to go through, God requires that if you're going to go with him with a perfect heart, you must have a broken heart. I don't have a lot of time to go into this. And the reason you must have a broken heart, it isn't a heart that grieves over the fact that I lost a loved one. That could be 
I will empathize with that with what you, this tragedy you experienced. That is not a broken heart. A broken heart, God says in Psalm 51, that he will not find any fault with a broken and contrite heart. What that means is that he has to move in your heart and break every stronghold that's there, every sense of uh, resistance that you have, every defense mechanism that you're going to throw up to protect yourself. A broken heart, a broken and contrite heart, is a heart that has had all its defenses eliminated. There are no defenses. And when a heart is like that, it becomes a perfect heart. That means that how will God use you? He will pour his spirit out and it will be uninhibited. When you hear the need, you'll meet the need. You won't, you, what will you experience? You'll experience freedom. I was going to ask you, are you at peace in that situation? Are you what? Are you at peace in the situation? Absolute okay. perfect peace. Because the peace of God surpasses all understanding. Because you don't understand all the circumstances going on, right? That's right. And I want to address that. Because in every situation, God has an X factor that you don't know anything about that he's working on right now, if you're trusting him. And number two, if you have experienced a broken and contrite heart. See, now to be a comforter, a great comforter in a great time of tribulation, everyone that enters into this phase of whatever we're going into will have had to go through a broken heart. And the broken heart will simply mean that every form of resistance that you have for what comes your way will not be those of resistance. It will be these things that will flow through you like a river. There won't be any problem, no obstacles. They will come right on through, and you will be the one that God says, I want you to deal with that problem. And the tighter this thing gets the more people we're going to have that come up here not just to sit in a Sunday morning service and pay their dues. They're coming for help. And one of the things that happened in 9-11 when it came to the church, they didn't get the help. Let me say this. If you read 58, Psalm, uh, Isaiah 58, we don't have time to go to it. It says, you will be a restorer of the breach. Understand something about a broken heart. Anybody with a broken heart can recognize when something is ruined and step forward to try to repair it. It says you're the restorer of the breach. You are the lifter of these generations. So we got all kinds. Well, I talked to this little girl at the bank and saw the grief in her heart. She's got a nice title there at the bank. And I looked at her yesterday. Well, I have to keep going to that bank because when I looked at her, this girl's life, she's probably maybe 35 to 40, 41. She told me about her own life. She shows me the picture of her three teenage children, and she said, when they went back, I was destroyed. You know what? I gave her something. I said, read this. Took her little book. I want you to read it. Why? Because at that point, we can start resurrecting something that's broken. She needs to be put back together. So what we're dealing with are all kinds of broken things. But a broken heart qualifies you to fix things that are ruined. What book did you give her? Uh, the, this first one I gave her, The Life That God Rewards. <laughs> so, I, I, I've got another book that I want to take to her right away. The best book on her first coming to Christ is Now That I Believe by Dr. Cook. Great book. I want to get it in her hands. I don't have the opportunity to be intimate in her life. But I want to keep giving her these things. I said, have you noticed anything that happened? She said, a little bit. That was encouragement to me. But the, all this mess at the bank has been for her. It's been a thorn and a pain. But this is for this girl. And to see this little girl, this, this girl, her life start to come back together again, start to fit into place, you see. What could be more wonderful than that? Uh, I just, uh, that, uh, there were two series of scriptures Isaiah 58, 12, And they that be of thee shall build the old waste places, those are the ruins. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of prayer, uh, paths to dwell in. It's the, it is the assurance always that things are going to change for her. What else could I offer her? If this thing is going to be restored in her life and she's going to be put by, I say, hey, you got change. Finally, if you read in 1 John chapter 3, it says, Now, 
it does not yet appear. We shall be. We know that when we shall see him, we uh, we shall see him as he is. Every man that hath this, please listen to this. Hope hath this hope within him, purifieth himself, even as he is impure. All that we've talked about is hope, which becomes purified as in him, which permits me with a broken heart to fix things in ruin. Great calling. Not just come up here and sit, and put my money here, go out there put these things back together that are all broken. I, and if you don't have a broken heart, don't fight me. I'm going to break yours. I want to break yours. Why would I break yours so I could have the power coming through? I can have the power coming through. Close this gate.